must die young. Hello, welcome to another episode of Industry Interviews with me, your host, uh, Lance Dean Anthony Nielsen. Um, just on my own this evening, being Sunday, Jubilee, you know, everybody's out, got the bunting and taking part in street parties. Apart from me, I've been slaving over a script as per normal. I've got a fantastic guest uh, coming on tonight. He's a dear friend of mine, I've known for many years, um, and that's the lovely actor, uh, Jason Sulky. But before we bring him in, uh, for those of you not familiar with him, and he has done lots of other things apart from Sharp, uh, I would just like to show you a bit of his work. So we're going to see if we can share that now. Now, I was going to share screen, but I think I'm going to be able to share the video file directly. No, it's not going to let me do that. Okay, I'm going to have to share screens. All right, let's do that. Okay, so I'm going to show you some of the work um, of the great Jason Sulky, and then we will have a chat with him. So here we are. I'm just doing my job and it's not easy. I don't use weapons. Did you know, for instance, in Burma you get seven years in prison for telling jokes? Next time you laugh, I want you to think of the Papa Lay, the Burmese stand up comedian. Uh huh. Is that right? You're in the bath now. Give away to people. You know, it's a gesture of love. So people are sort of vibrating on the same sort of frequency as me. You could have some if you want. Your vibrations seem pretty compatible. <laughs> We lull to him, he's lull to us, in life and in death. We trust him with our lives, and he trusts us with his life. dealing with it very well. That was Billy Hannessy. His dad owns his place. I thought you owned it. I'm just the manager. This club, like most other clubs in this town, belongs to George. Harris, can you help? Try, sir. Donde están los soldados ingleses? Aquí están. He says they're here, sir. Let's see them. Traigolos. Uno entiendo que vos me dices. I'm going to have a it. Gets his tongue round it. Name? From Pakistan. Don't lie to me, Shafiq. Where are you from? From Pakistan, Karachi. Don't fucking lie to me! One more time now. Where are you from? Please, can you sit down? Uh, Hi, what can I get you? One coffee, Anything please. Provided? Do you want something to drink? Two coffees, okay. please. Anna, can you please sit down? Everyone's looking at us. Okay, delicious. Not very good French. Is that all? No, there's more. It was you who wanted a divorce and the court came to a fair settlement. No, it's not fair! Please, Anna, don't scream. Pull yourself together. Look, it's better than Anton stays with me. 
I can get with life. He's accustomed to you. You can't. It's the way it goes. It's the way it is. <laughs> you know, Bookback. What, so you can take him to Russia? Look, man, this is all a big mistake. I'm a man of peace. I've got Buddhas in my bedroom. You, yes, oh, I'm so sorry, you, 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 we volunteered together at Amnesty International a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's right. There is a Burmese situation, Tom Burn. I mean, good. Yeah, and so he called me up out of the blue for Christmas lunch, so here I am. Really? <laughs> <laughs> also, we should have uniform backup right here. My name's the lady. I'm a police officer. Not correct for Lazarus. I suppose we could remove his ears. It's another solution to the problem. Would you like to be chef? Eh? So the table, talk frog, a little lardy da. Eh? Not very much, sir. But if you give me Conchita's apple. That seems like a good place to uh, pause it there on the Conchita's garden, apple. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to. Um, I'm going to save some of that in case I need a backup, uh, in case I need a loo break. Um, I'm going to welcome to the stream the actor Jason Sulky. Thank you so much for coming on and giving up part of your Sunday evening and missing the football, no less. Well, the football's over. Lovely to see everyone. Thank you for having me, Lance. Uh, unfortunately, Ukraine lost. Oh. Good for Wales, though. Good for Wales. Wales in their first World Cup in 64 years. So <clears throat> it's all good. But great to be here. Thanks. Uh, it's really nice to have you on the channel. And I've been doing lots of these um since i'd started taking this whole thing a bit more seriously and i mentioned to um jason uh early on we've got to get you on at some point and we've pinned down a date finally so i'm i'm, I'm really um chuffed to to have you on um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask you a few quick questions um just to get to know you a little bit so our audience can uh, know your tastes and things what was the very first movie you saw on the big screen at the cinema when you were a wee bairn if you can remember that far back Right, I can. I'm good at memory. Um, the films I really remember watching over and over because I used to live, or oh, my mum still lives on Moscow Road, Queensway. There used to be the ABC Queensway and the Odeon Westbourne Grove right within a spitting distance. So I used to watch movies all the time. And I really remember watching Zulu. Ah, brilliant. And The Jungle Book. Okay. Over and over and over and over and over. Those are probably two of my favourite films. I don't know why. They're so, so disparate uh, sort of genres. Um, uh, but I also remember watching The Love Bug, Herbie. Those those are the kind of movies that I used to go to the movies and watch. I remember I mean, The I, Love I, Bug. Yeah, and, I, and uh, American Graffiti. When I got a little bit older, sort of 11, 12, I watched that quite a few times. I loved that. Yeah, I, I, went, I went to see Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. Did you see that one? That was, was that one of the first ones, or that, that was the sequel, I think. Oh, right, yeah, probably did. Yeah, probably came, came out a bit later. Um, what was the last film you saw at the cinema? Wow, that may have been pre lockdown. Uh, oh, yeah, it was the James Bond, the new James Bond. Okay, well, the old okay. James Bond, the, old, the, the new, you know, the latest James Bond. What did you think of it? Um, I can barely remember actually. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot's happened since then. Yes, yeah. Um, I I didn't like that uh, Daniel Craig died, James Bond. Oh, am I giving away a spoiler? Oops. Well, um, I think most people have probably seen it, so I think, I think so. Have. Yeah, I didn't like that, but I do like Daniel Craig. Um, I have I have worked with him, as some will well know, on Sharp. Uh, yeah. Really cool guy. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, the film's good. I mean, I love Bond. I love Bond. It didn't it didn't jump out at me as one of the best or or anything fantastic. Yeah, I think I mean, I'm pro probably with you on that. Yeah. I wasn't keen on them killing him particularly, but yeah, I mean, maybe... I'm so in love with Connery still. It's ridiculous, I know, but uh, yeah, just anything other than Connery is just not really that fantastic. Although the movies are great, Sam Mendes is a great director. Yeah, uh, they've got some great actors in there, uh, you know. And as I said, Daniel is perfect. He's just so he's just so efficient in getting across his thoughts and and what's going through his mind. You know, I just love him, love him. Well, maybe they'll give you a role on a future Bond film as like maybe somebody working for M or a villain. You never know. Yeah. You know, I think I blew my Bond moment. Um, it was, 
I think it was a Pierce Brosnan movie. I can't remember which one, but it's one where he dives out of this American CIA plane and in a special suit and dives millions of miles down below into the water. Yeah. And I auditioned for the part of the sergeant, American Marine sergeant, who gets him ready. And I was sent the the text on fax. Remember faxes in those old days? And I didn't realize that my machine had broken or the paper had run out. And I thought, oh, that's the script. Oh, it's oh, it's, a, it's a bit chopped off there. Oh, it's, it's probably not, nothing's there. And I I learned everything. Got to the got to the audition, and there was like a whole two pages, and it was almost impossible to learn. And I just that was awful. It, I felt so. Oh. Cool. The one thing I really wanted to do a bomb movie in my life so much, and I completely pancaked the audition. I just I was so. I wanted to kick myself in the head. But there you go. If anyone from Eon Productions is watching, please give Jason another shot. I'm sure he yeah. won't disappoint on the day. Um, what about um, theatre? What was the very first play you remember going to see? Right. Um, I, this is interesting because uh, my parents used to take me to plays and I remember going to see a Shakespeare play at the Mermaid Theatre. The Not mermaid. entirely sure which one, but but there were some beheadings or some hangings, and that really freaked me out. Big star, obviously quite young. Mm. But then my parents, uh, then later on, my parents were friends with someone called Adrian Mitchell. I'm not sure if you know Adrian Mitchell. He's a writer, playwright from the 70s, mainly, so sort of left wing. And he had a play at the Shaw Theatre. Okay. And there was lots of swearing in it. Like they had a, a song called, uh, if I can swear on this channel, uh, a, a song called yeah. Fuck Off Friday. Fuck off Friday, it's a day that we love when all the teachers get the shove. It's fuck off Friday, the day that we love. Now, this is like 40 years ago, and I'm still singing that song. That's the impression that that had on me. So theatre did have a big impression. Those are probably two of the first ones I remember going to, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think if I'd gone to see a play and that song was in it, fuck off Friday, I'm fairly sure I would remember that. Yeah, he did... Um... Quite a bit of stuff for the Royal Shakespeare Company. I'm just reading about him. This him was now. at the Shaw Theatre, probably 1972-3. Yeah, he passed away in 2008. Um, yeah. Sadly. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. He was, nice. he was really anarchic. I remember going to his house in Hampstead, and, you know, so it was yep. great. To, it was brilliant seeing uh, his work on stage. Just, just remember it so well. He Pow did a Power to the people. It was, all, it was a real sort of left-wing, you know, down with the bosses type play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see he, he sort of talks um, on his Wikipedia. There's a lot of stuff about Northern Ireland and yeah. the war in Iraq. Yeah, You'll remember what a great probably. cause that was. Because um, yeah. my dad, my dad was a writer and a poet and a, a bit of a lefty Marxist. So that's that's the kind of well. Let let, 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 let let's get into that. I mean, w tell us how it all started for you. Um, I, I mean, we'll talk about your book, which I know covers some of that, but. Sure. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm going to plug Jason's book throughout this uh, episode. It's mm -hmm. here. I've got a signed copy of uh, from the Crimea with love, mainly about the time filming shot, but other things too. We'll come back to that. Um, but how did it all start for you? What, what was the what was the thing that gave you the acting bug? When did you know that was what you wanted to do? Well, I mean, it could be it could be the little brother thing. I've got a bigger brother who was who has to. Be, be heard to be seen and is actually it could be the redhead thing um my uh, my all my parents have black hair my my brother has black hair and i get it from my great grandfather on my mum's side who was a scouse irish street musician performer so i'm i say i get it from there but i was always uh showing off uh, whenever the school play came along in primary school, from the earliest age, I was always in the school plays. I went to Fox Primary School in Notting Hill Gate, quite a well-known one, very sort of uh, middle class. And, and you know, it, it, it's actually very diverse, but there are lots of uh, famous actors and, and, and such set their kids there, as well as Holland Park, which is where I went to next. So I was always doing plays. I remember playing uh, Mark Antony in a, in a Julius Caesar uh, adaptation. This is in primary school. We had some pretty serious stuff. And I remember, you know, <laughs> it's a Julius Caesar in primary. Yeah. yeah, but it was an adaptation, obviously. Yeah, but I remember I was quite, I was big and strong. I, I, I was able to carry Caesar after, after giving him the etu brutes. I was able to uh, carry him, and we were wearing toga, towel togas. Um, I also remember doing a skit where I, I wanted to play the, uh, the Monty Python guy on the piano. Uh, was it, was it, um, 
Yeah. Terry, uh, Terry Jones. Yeah. And, he, and he's naked. Naked with a pair of boxing gloves. Do you remember in Monty Python? They'd cut to it. Yeah, cut yeah. To it. And I said I want to be there, and then I but I had to wear shorts. I was I was willing to do it with just in the buff with boxing gloves. I think that was probably but, a good decision of the schools at, at the time. Well, um, it was back in 1970, 71, so you probably could have got away with it. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, so loads of loads of plays all the way through through Fox School, and then I went to Holland Park and I had a really good drama program where we did a we did an adaptation of Lord of the Flies, where I played uh, Piggy to my great friend Guy Moore's Ralph. Uh, and it was an adaptation, but you know, I end up getting killed. Piggy gets killed. And that yeah. that really that really set my mind on 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 trying to be an actor also because I thought it was quite easy to do and you didn't have to learn maths or do you know be academically great. But then I my dad got a job in America and um I moved to Amherst Massachusetts when I was 14. Hence the so, t-shirt. Yes, yes Amherst Mass and this T-shirt is relevant because it says only the M is silent. So Amherst is how you say it. No, sorry, sorry, the H is silent. H. Yeah, Amherst. And because Amherst. it's it's a five college community, and there's lots of uh, po politics, and you know everyone's very politically active. So only the H is silent. Anyway, so we moved to Amherst, Mass. My father is a, was um uh, a, a, a writer broadcaster poet and teacher and he did a lecture tour in america of his poems and his books and he was offered a job in hampshire college in amherst massachusetts in 1976 so i moved there so obviously i was knocked off off kilter a little bit and i didn't get straight into doing plays um i got into sports a bit more basketball soccer frisbee which we'll get onto as well and um I took a I, in my drama class. We were doing we were doing a play, and I obviously read something some some English script. You know, when when back in those days, they hear an English accent, they think you're the best, you're the greatest actor, you're fantastic. So this uh, this director said, "Listen, I, I think I think you should start kind of be an actor." I said, "No, I, I was an actor once. I'm, I'm more into playing frisbee and doing sports, actually." Thank you. I said, "No, no, I think you should do this," and I did this Dostoevsky. Um, adaptation of, of a small uh, a short play called Bobak or the gambler and uh it was really good we won we won awards um at boston the massachusetts state play awards i won a gold medal um and then we did uh, we did sh we did check off in the final year and in that final year since, uh, since I, I lived in amherst it was a five college community my father taught at one of those colleges hampshire college we were invited as a high school unit to go to the college drama class and to show off what we had done and i thought i was the greatest actor in the world you know i'm english i'm quite great and we did our scene and the 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 college teacher was very sort of not dismissive but really wanted to put me in my place you know and she did um and then that next year i went to college she was my drama teacher which is quite funny so <clears throat> so she already had it sort of in for me and um infamy infamy we're going no um and <laughs> yeah. so i took her class and it was really hard to get into but i, I, I was allowed in because she's i'd sort of auditioned already and at this point i had become um a freestyle frisbee player and i was really into that and i was going and i was going from massachusetts down to new york for the weekends to play with the hardcore freestylers and um i missed my bus back on the sunday night it took a monday morning bus missed the class didn't think anything of it got a call the next day or that morning saying, Jason, where were you? Oh, I'm sorry. I was in New York. Come back. I said, you went to New York and you didn't come back. Jason, forget it. Do not come back to my class again. Forget drama this year. I was like, Oh, so I was like wiped out of the whole <laughs> drama program for the whole first year, which I intended to, to be part of, you know, by this sort of vindictive teacher. Anyway, in the end, I was invited back into the fold. I, I did a, a part in a, a play called The Insect Comedy by the Capek Brothers, which was an interesting expressionist play. But I uh, played a few parts in that. One has helped, uh, won myself back into a favour and ended up being one of the top students in the in in the in the school in college so it was all good and then from college if you want, do you want me to pause yeah i was just going to say i mean apart from her darth vader like ways was she was she a good teacher she was amazing great yeah she was amazing but she was one of those tough new york 
treat them mean, break them down. She she believed in that. There's this sort of school of thought in America where you have to break you down to get yeah. the roar. And I don't believe in that shit. I'm sorry. I, I believe in, you know, you find, you'll find it, but you don't have to make... And she was making girls go through nervous breakdowns and having fights with each other and stuff. Although, you know, it was a bit too much. Yeah, 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 I hear what you're saying. You, you can get results like that, probably. It, it, you know, yeah, maybe it's your... It's not the healthiest route for some people. No. That can affect yeah. some people for life. Yeah. So, yeah. And if you're working on a workshopping a play, like a Mike Lee did for 16 weeks or something, yeah, you can probably explore those kind of things. But this was a class, you know, where we're yeah, doing yeah, it for, yeah. for... Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so ended up um, doing a bunch of plays. And then I did um, I did uh, Joe Orton's um, uh, Roughing on the Stair. Do you know Joe Orton's work? I do know Joe Orton's work. I'm not familiar yeah. with that one. Ruffy on a stair, it's one of his plays, uh, along with Loot, what the butler saw, um, Erpingham Camp. They're all his, he only wrote about six or seven before he was killed. And I directed that. And I directed it with my, with my, some of my favorite actors from the five college communities, Smith College, UMass, Amherst College, etc. Mm. And um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to direct and act in Mother Courage by Bertolt Brecht. So that was my senior thesis, my, my last uh, hurrah in, in college. And, uh, I was ready, I thought, for the big professional world. And uh, I mean, that, that, so did you come back to the UK to kickstart your career effectively? Because uh, I did. Your, your early stuff, if we can talk about that, I don't want to spend too long on it, but um, the, the, the early stuff that you did would be, um, Memphis Bell, which I visited the set for for a day, and I think uh, I might have been there the same day as you. Actually, if you're if you're talking about the the bit where all the lads were like kicking football around the control tower set, and yeah, in Lincolnshire, yeah, and waiting, oh, yeah, for, yeah and waiting yeah. for the yeah. A friend of mine was was on it, and I I I can't remember what happened exactly, but I blagged my way, like I often do with these things, like I blagged my way onto the set of Judge Dredd. And uh, when it when it was filming at Shepparton, and yeah, because I remember that Sean Astin mm. was was the only one of the the main cast that were the the crew with Matthew Modine and all that. He was the only one that kind of was a bit aloof. Everybody else was, yeah, let's come and play football with all the extras. Um, yeah, Sean was a and listen, this is at the very early days of his career. I'm sure he's a lot more laid back now, mm. but. Um, yeah, he was a bit aloof and didn't really want to hang out with anyone else. And no, that, that's his process. That's 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 fair enough. But that, yeah. that was that was quite a happy set, though, if I remember rightly. Yeah, it it was an interesting experience. Um, you, that's interesting you say that because I just was speaking to my buddy called Neil Giantoli. He was what he was the the tail the the tail gunner, the um, you know the yeah, yeah. Tail gunner. and he was saying how. They were so everyone was so in so up their own ass, like you were saying. He was like Sean Aston. I, I thought Sean was also a bit like that as well, actually. But he right. was kind of cool with me. Um, yeah, they were Eric Stoltz, Billy Zane, Tate. Although, yeah, they kind of were. They were they were hungry for being the next star. They didn't have the time. You know, I did I did hang out with Billy Zane quite a bit actually because you know he liked to relax in a certain way. So we we partied in a bit. Uh, but all the others weren't. Eric Stoltz were like, very standoffish until they were sitting in their hotel room one night and the Miller Lite beer advert came on. And then it was like, hey, Jason, man, that's cool. You were great. Hey, blah, blah, blah. And then I was then I was a real person because I was on screen. And it's <laughs> Yeah, uh, even though I, even though I was an actor in the movie they, they're in, you know. But the but the, the interesting part, which I wanted I must cover, is um. Go on. So Patsy Pollock, famous casting director, she was the English casting director on it. Mm. And we were told there were like there were like a bunch of us told that we were going to we were going to read in for these parts, but there's a chance we might get one or two of them, the smaller parts. And I thought that sounds a bit weird. I mean, you know, casting the part or not. I mean, you know, I'm not a huge famous actor, but I'm an actor. Anyway. So we 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 kind of like we're doing that, and then we're told no, this is the real cast, and we met the real cast. They all came to into Pinewood. We had a read through, and then we I found out I was like one of the football players, football player. Although it was it was softball in the end, but we did a lot of hanging out with the main cast. 
you know, these this shad the shadow cast, you know, seven or, or seven or so guys with the main cast. And um up in um up in Bimbrook, we did a lot of hanging out in the green room. So I remember playing lots and lots of table tennis. And um David Strathern was one of the best players. You know Dave Strathern? Yeah, he's a yeah. fantastic actor. And I, fantastic. And I, the best ping pong player on, on the set. Um, the next best player was Sasha Putnam. And that's the son of David Putnam, the producer. And, yeah. he, was a, and he was a buddy of mine from Notting Hill. So he was actually working on a film. So it's great. It was, like, it was such a great fun time. But um, And I think, I think his dad, David. So the top three were those three. And I was the fourth. And I remember all these other, all the... All the actors like uh, Harry Connick Jr. was one of the, was a hey today. He thought he's so cool, with it, but I kicked his butt every time. Which I I, were I forgot he was in it. Yeah, Harry Connick Jr. was in it. I'll yeah, totally I think forgot. it was his first acting role. But he was obviously a, a singer who was yeah. who, who joined the. But it's a great film, lovely film. I really had a great time working. It. Worked in it for three weeks in Binbrook. I worked for one day, I think. The rest right. of the time, I was watching Tour de France and playing t ping pong in, in the in the green room. Did you and, meet and, Did you meet Stephen McIntosh? Of course, yes, yes, yeah, Steve Mac, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I met because him before, he was yeah. in he was in the same production of Bugsy Malone as me. Uh, of course, uh, um, in the eighties, and which um, I think he was in the cast with Catherine Zeta Jones. It's all so long ago now. Right, I can't really remember these things, but um, oh, Catherine yeah. Zeta Jones was in it too. Yeah, she played Tallulah. And um, I'm sure she. Oh, was sorry. A... Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the movie. Sorry. You're, you're, yeah, the there were. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, he was in the stage production, and I think it was '83, and there were six casts of thirty, and um, the, the, and I, I came into it very late um, uh, as an understudy for one of or well, the same role he was doing uh, mm. actually, and and was supposed to do the the, the the tour, and then it oh it didn't really happen, and oh it was all a bit of a mess, but um, mm. uh, but yeah. Uh, yes, even Mac. Yeah, I, I met him before, so I knew we did. We hung out a bit. He's, he's lovely. Yeah, really good actor. Really good. Yeah, I probably I really do rate rate him. Um, yeah, fantastic chat. So you did you did some of the kind of tours of duty of TV at that time. So there was like yes. Boone, Bergerac, The Bill. I'll talk about Russia House in in a, in a sec. You were on The Bill about seven times, right? Uh, I think it's five. Five. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's quite. I mean, quite a lot of character actors would get different parts on it over over the years when i was watching your show reel again i was like i remember this episode mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I, know, I know i'd i know i'd seen it and then you came back as a they had you back as a copper detective is that yeah right? the first one was the copper that one um the, I, I'm a police officer that was quite yeah. a smallest role and then the next one i had was the hippie oh yeah. i love the aura man that was oh so much fun to play and and Sean Bean really loved the episode too because I remember going back onto Sharp. He's like, "Oh, Jason, I saw you. Oh, you're great in that, mate. Great." And then the, <laughs> the last one was where I play a really nasty, nasty killer called Jason Danziger. Right. He was a really horrible, nasty murderer. <clears throat> sounds sounds like a good name for a for a killer. Um, yeah. what? How did you come to get cast on the Russia House? And did you have any scenes with Connery or Pfeiffer on that? Alas, I didn't have any scenes with Sean or Mish. Um, I just yeah. auditioned for it. Um, I Because I lived in America, my agent knew that, and I was put up for lots of American parts. So I, I became part of that little group um, yeah. of actors. And the American actors didn't resent it too much because they knew I'd lived in America. I went to high school, I went to college, and you know I could mm. uh, pass all American accent and all that kind of shit. So I was in that little niche. So Memphis Bell, Russia House, all those. I'm all up for it. Um, so could I remember my audition? Uh, it was with Mary Selway, another huge casting director. Rest in, may she rest in peace. Fantastic. Yeah, lovely. she was. She, she came to see one of my plays, and I got introduced to her. Yeah, uh, and someone went, Lance. I don't know if you know this, but this is Mary Selway, and she had this big fur coat on, and was quite a small woman, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this coat was huge. And I was like, of course, I've heard of Miss Selway. And I sort of took mm. her hand and kissed her like the Queen. Yeah, totally. Uh, she is. She was the queen. I was so gutted yeah. to hear that she died. And anyway, so yeah. um, I didn't work with Michelle or or, or or Sean, but we filmed on Hammersmith Road, on that big shiny mirror building just before Hammersmith Broadway. I know what you mean. They call it Court, and that doubled as CIA headquarters. And I worked with. I didn't work with Michelle Sean, but I worked with Roy Scheider. Oh, yeah. oh. 
So man, what a great dude. And I and I'd gone to I'd gone to college in America with his daughter. So we had lots to talk about. So it's really cool. So he really he stuck to me. We talked a lot. We had pictures taken. Um uh Jane uh, Edward Fox. Right. Michael Kitchen. I love Michael Kitchen. Yeah. Um uh, uh, Charlotte Charlotte Cor yeah, Charlotte Cornwell. Remember Charlotte Cornwell? Yeah. She was in Rock, was it Rock Follies or something? Oh, anyway. check, but, but I know who you mean. Um, and who's uh, Michael Kitchen? Michael Kitchen, and there's one more. Yeah, and Mac McDonald as well. You know, no, you don't know Mac McDonald. No, he's another American actor. Um, just trying to think of the really famous ones. Yeah, that was that was all. Yeah, Michael yes. But a really good time. Um, had a great laugh. Uh, not that many. Oh, Ken Russell. Ken Russell. <laughs> Ken Russell had a small part, and that was the most hilarious days filming I'd ever had and, and shocking as well. I was like, my God, he's getting away with all this stuff. This is incredible. We're messing around doing takes and the, the director, uh, Fred Skep Shepsey, Fred Skepsey. Fred, yeah, House. Fred Shepsey. Uh, yeah. I couldn't believe he was putting up with it. It was, but it was, it was Ken Russell, you know, it was just, he couldn't do the same line twice. He was messing around. Oh, great experience. Lovely. I mean, to be paid to do that. Amazing. To work with somebody like Roy Schneider must have been, I mean, that's, you know, because you must have seen Jaws at the cinema when you were younger. And I think we all did, didn't we? Yeah. So um, was that, did you learn it, anything by watching him as an actor? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I try to take away uh, some bit of learning from everything I do. But yeah, just 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 watching how, how when the, the camera, when it's action, just I, I just watch that and just the the economy, the economy of the movement and just the little. Oh, beautiful. But yeah, I mean, I can't I can't specifically say, but, you know, I, I was so yeah. full of shit. I thought I knew everything, you know, but but watching that. And, you know, I used to watch Derek Jacobi as well from the side of the stage when I did a Shakespeare play. Uh, before before sharp mm. that was amazing doing that but yeah so i do try to take on something try and you know glean something from those mega stars i've worked with yeah I'm very lucky to have worked with um yeah i mean i i remember the seeing the russia house at the cinema so i'm pretty chuffed that you you got to work with schneider and no longer with us of course and also um yeah i i so charlotte cornwell who you mentioned I saw her in so many things. The first thing I saw him was White Hunter, Black Heart, uh, directed uh, by Clint Eastwood. One of his lesser known films. I, th I think one mm. of his best. Um, and she passed away in 2021. So I didn't oh, know. No. Yeah, she passed away January of last year. I didn't know we'd lost her. Um, and she's a she's actually John Le Carre's sister. No, really. John Le Carre is actually called Al Al Alex Cornwell, something Cornwell. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's funny I should go on to work with Bernard Cornwall not long after that, you know, the writer of Sharp, obviously. So yeah. Cornwell's a, a dear to me. Yeah, it's, it's got half sibling um yeah. written next to it. Oh, oh half sibling, okay. Yeah, that's pretty right. and yeah. and uh the, the the icing on the cake was one of my my dad's a writer, but one of his favorite writers, probably the famous favorite writer, was John Le Carre. Had all his books, so I was so so happy that my dad was alive at that point too, so I was, I was so happy. I was in the Russian house because it was one of my dad's faves. <clears throat> yeah, that. Uh, but you, what you've touched on, quite an important subject for me there. Uh, I, I want to ask you about that as you brought it up. As an actor or any creative, it's a massive motivator, isn't it, to hit a certain level while your parents are still here from a personal <laughs> pride point of view. Would you agree? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, um. I, I, in a way, I'm lucky. <clears throat> lucky, unlucky. Um, <clears throat> my dad died in '95. Sharp ended in '96, seven, and my career sort of steadily declined from then on. So my dad never really saw my decline. He probably thought I was going to go and win an Oscar from where I was at the, at the height of where I was. But uh, but I don't care. That, that's cool. He got to see me. I mean, you know, he, he's he always had great faith in me. An actor was never told me not to do it that they never told me to be an accountant or i mean well 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 i know sharp's a big part of your career and you know <clears throat> it's uh, in some ways it's uh, I, that's why i want to talk about the other things as well because sure, i think a lot, a lot of people just talk about shot and we will talk about it but um uh you've got to remember as well jason that there are i'm friends with i've got i don't know two and a half thousand friends on my facebook and i've met nearly all of them Wow. And probably about 75% of them are actors. Mm. And there are very few of them that can say, by the way, I've been in an iconic television series. 
Sure. So I'm, I'm sure you, you know, even though, okay, maybe your career didn't hit certain other places you were aiming for, you've got to, you've got to cherish that, surely. And I certainly do, Lance. Listen, mate, I was in the Miller Light ad and I was in Sharp. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I can't, I cannot complain for those two. You know, it's so instantly pointed to. Oh, you're yeah. an actor, what do you do? I did that. Oh, and I yeah. know many actors slog away without being recognized at all. And they grab, I so admire that, that, that uh, dedication. You know, I don't want to go, I don't really want to go slogging to Frimpton Rep doing, you know, shows for mm. Tuppet. I really don't. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm a lazy, lazy bugger. That's, that's probably why I'm not, that's why my career did die because I didn't do enough theater. Um, but well, when yeah. we, when we do a play, I'll make sure I book a theatre just up the road from you. <laughs> yes, we, well, we, sure. we do want to do. We're hoping we might do a play together at some point. That could happen for sure. Well, there's lots of theatres in London. That's for yeah, sure. There, there, yeah, there, there are. But yeah, there are. I, I'm I'm acutely aware that uh, I should count my my lucky stars for for landing those two. And I was in About a Boy as well. About a Boy is is yeah. on. It's like a Christmas staple. I get texts from around the world. Hey, I just saw you in this. I just saw you on a plane. I just in the from, you know, so so yeah, I, I'm not complaining. Uh, let, let's talk about about boy briefly because you got to work with mm. Hugh Grant, but you also got to work with um, God Tony Colette. Name. Thank you. We just talked about her uh, on the last stream um, we did with Charlie Swift Parker, who was a, a mm. British actor who I interviewed, and we were talking about actors who inspire us, and that immediately he said he said her. Um, <clears throat> And I, I've watched almost everything she's done. And until I was watching the bits on your reel, I completely forgot, A, that, that she was in that with you, and B, you were set up as her love interest. Yes, um, yes. Which was quite sweet. Yeah. Um, how was that working on that production? How was you? How was she? And, you know, you made your part stand out in that, I remember. You didn't have a lot, but you made it stand out. You know, I'm a lucky bugger. Um, I went to the audition and it were these two, these two American uh, college guys, brothers, vice brothers. And having lived in America, we clicked, we talked to la, 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 la. And I was auditioning for the part of the, the kid, the main Nicholas Holt, the main kid, his, his dad, who was divorced and the mum, Tony Collette's the mum. And um, I thought, oh, great. It's quite a good part. It's a dinner party. It's, uh, and um, they called up. And they said, "Look, we don't want you for that part, but we want you for this other part. We're not quite sure what it is, but but you, you're going to be Amnesty International. You're going to be on the phones. Like, oh, great! It's going to be a one line. Oh, okay, fine." And we did that scene, and it was really great. Um, Hugh, I had um, I played football with and met because Liz was on Sharp. Liz Hurley was on Sharp. Um, Liz Hurley. After we did Sharp, Liz asked me if I wanted to play football with Hugh uh, uh, at Christmas. One Christmas, I went to play with him. It was a great laugh. We hit it off great. So it was nice to go back and work with you. We knew each other. <clears throat> after I shot that scene, they called my agent and said, "Listen, we'd like to add Jason into the end scene." So I thought I was just doing that one scene, Amnesty International, on the phone. Uh, Papa Lay, seven years for telling a, a stand-up comedian in Burma, blah blah blah. So I was added to the end scene where I'm. I'm Try, I'm, he sets me up with Tony Collette. So it, the part sort of expanded as it went along. And so, yeah, it, it was amazing. And, and Tony Collette's great. She was actually quite um, quite knackered. She'd been filming for months on end in England, was dying to get back to Australia. So she was a bit like depressed. And I thought, oh, yeah, I, I didn't really actually know who she was. I hadn't seen a lot of her films until that point. And then from then on, I, everything she, I saw she was in. So I'm really... I think she's an amazing actress. As I said, I knew Hugh. Uh, he was great, although he was also experiencing film ennui. I remember him saying, oh, I'm experiencing film ennui. And I thought, nice one, Hugh. I'd, I'd love to bloody be bored of making films. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was a great, it was a really nice atmosphere. Um, we shot, we shot at a disused hospital in Greenwich. And where else did we shoot? Oh yeah, then we shot in, in um, Elstree Studios. That's so a film yeah that's lovely film. time great time that's a film that's aged quite well because i've seen it three times probably with like a five six year gap in between each time and apart from like no mobile phones or whatever being mm. key story it's it, i think it resonates quite well now you know the themes of bullying and um and and misdirection in life and all that kind of stuff still quite a relatable movie i think 
Absolutely. Uh, it's a good story. And, 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 you know, Nicholas Holt's really, really good. No wonder he's done well, you know, a little Yeah. Kid, yeah. He was really good. And Hugh Grant's fantastic. I mean, the end scene where they're doing the singing the song and he's comes up and joins him. Oh, love well, it. It's cringy. Well, it's, it's, it's emotional. It's like, ah, brilliant. As you seg segued, um, into sharp with Liz Hurley, we'll, 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 we'll segue into sharp. Now you've got oh. a whole, you've got a whole chapter in your book dedicated to Liz Hurley. Uh, for people watching, so, um, <laughs> not quite a chapter, but yeah, she's yeah, there's, she is... a, there's a significant section, of yeah, detailed, a segment, yeah, detailed description. Um, this is the book, it's a great read. By the way, I read this in two nights, as Jason knows. I was texting him saying, I'm on page 78 now, texting him an hour later, I'm on page 150 now, mm -hmm. and um, lots of your personal pickies, um, in here from uh, different times on the set. Uh -huh. Of course, you'll you'll forever be known as the the man who got Paul Paul McGann um, off of Sharp. Um, and I, I, I don't want to tell too many of the stories that in your that are in your book, but I think we should talk about that one. Well, um, yeah, we've got to talk about that one. Yeah, so many many people will know, but many people don't know that Sean Bean was not the first person cast as Sharp. Yeah, Sean Bean was interviewed along with Rufus Sewell, Clive Owen, Ian Glenn, Mark McGann, right. all the top talent. But the deal had been done with Paul McGann before. In my book, it's all in my book. Because the exec producer, Muir Sutherland, had done a film with Paul McGann called The, the Monk with Sophie yeah. Ward, 1990 Spanish co-production. And I reckon that that is when, and Paul McGann basically told me as much, that Muir said, oh, I've got this, Sting called Sharp, maybe it'd be good because Paul had done the monocled mutineer. So that's right, yeah. Remember. So they thought, oh, it must be a soldier, it must be good. So, so why am I mentioning this again? So, well, because he got cast, and then there was a yeah, he got cast, yes, yes, yes. And uh, we we're out, we're in the Crimea, uh, boiling hot, and uh, we I decide to bring a football along. I say, hey guys, let's go and play a game of football. And we played a game of football, cast versus crew, me, Paul McGann. Darrow O'Malley, et cetera, et cetera, chosen men against the exec producer and some of the crew. And in about 10 minutes in, Paul McGann went, hit the dirt without being tackled because his crucial ligament had snapped trying a manoeuvre. We didn't know that at the time. We thought he just had twisted it. He'd recover and play, play on later in the match, but he didn't. And we finished playing because he looked really in bad agony on the side of the pitch. Anyway, we got back. We're in the Crimea. In 1992, there's no x rays necessarily there, and there's no MRIs. I don't think MRIs being invented by then. So they just basically bandaged Paul's knee up to get him back on set the next day, basically, which was um, unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> they carried that on for another six weeks, and he re injured his knee twice once in a fight with, with Daniel Craig, who played a nasty character called Lieutenant Berry. Yeah, and then yeah. once when we were climbing up a, 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 a thick gorse bush, oh my Christ. Um, can, can I just forgot to bring up my um my power? Yeah. Can, can you pause and play my show where I'll get my power? I can. <laughs> Sorry, so, chaps. I I knew I should have forgotten something. I'll run now. Play the show. I'll be back with you in a second. I will. I've got. Uh, Sorry about another, that. Sorry about that. That's all right. I've got another section of Jason, uh, mainly from Sharp, which will will I'll quickly share screen because I had it prepared in case of this sort of eventuality. As I don't have a co-host uh, tonight. So um, what we're going to do is we're just going to pick this up quickly. Here we go. And uh, let's have a look at this. Hi, I'm Jason Salkey. I played Chosen Man Harris in the hit TV show Sharp's Rifle. Shot in the Crimea at the time the Soviet Union broke into 15 separate republics. On location, we shot battle seats full of danger and daring do. Once costumes were stored and rifles safely tucked away, we encountered daily mishaps, nutritional deprivation, and the unremitting chaos of post-Soviet Ukraine. From Crimea with Love is an insider's account of what it was like to make television legends at the epicenter of a tumultuous period in world history. I'll bring you an unvarnished look at what it was like for a pampered Western film unit to survive three tours of Crimean chaos in the early 90s. While the air was thick with glasnost perestroika, the world's gaze was focused further north on Moscow. 
Very little news of the Crimea ever made onto Western news agendas. The Charge and Light Brigade and Florence Nightingale were all we knew of the Crimea until Putin liberated the peninsula back in 2014. My story is an irreverent, <laughs> often humorous, but always accurate look at the glamour of filmmaking in the former Soviet Union in the summer of 1992 and beyond. However, the battle to bring this book to fruition hinges on your assistance with funding. A signed hardback copy and other sharp related goodies could be yours if you pledge your support. Chosen Man Harris, 95th, <laughs> <a> rifle. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it doesn't depend on, it does depend on your support. Please buy one. But the book is now available because uh, I think you crowdfunded to get it out, didn't you? Yeah, that was the crowdfunding video. Um, you pay 20 quid, you get a hardback and there are other pledges, higher pledges up to a lecture. Two five, 250. So, yeah. So but it's now available on Amazon, Waterstones everywhere around the yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rollicking read. It's a good, good perspective for actors to know what it's really like on a film set of a tv absolutely show. yeah D darrow malley who played um, harper says it should be used for film students or you know in college yeah. to, to <laughs> just say listen if you think it's going to be glamour when you go on film set well here let me read this was the, was, was there any pushback to you publishing that because there's quite a bit of dirt on people in it um you know <sighs> i mean nothing terrible but just no, there's, no. there's a lot of little gossipy stories yeah. which are fun was there yeah. any pushback from anyone no, not really. I, I I cleaned the hell out of it too. I mean, it started out real dirty and, and <laughs> yeah, and I can imagine. Bitchy and oh man, can you imagine? I, I was writing it. I, so the reason I wrote uh, um, a book is because I kept a diary, and the part I played was a was a, the, the whole thing. The whole sharp thing is as a Bernard Cornwall creation, but he didn't write my character. Right. They they wanted to have a clever clever soldier so they found out there was this guy called Reifman Harris who didn't write the book but recalled his stories and the book was called The Recollections of Reifman Harris so I read that book when I got the part for, of Sharp I thought hey why don't I be the Harris of this TV show and I will I will keep a diary every day um, and so that's how it came about the fact I had I had so so it's the stuff I was writing about 30 years ago you know sometimes I was really mad and I was that such and such and such and such so yeah there was a lot of bitching that had to be when i was transcribing from my written diary to the computer yeah a lot of stuff got cleaned up and then when my editor got a hold of it and she was a bit of a i mean guardian reading lefty and the i i love the guardian so i'm not ragging up but she was a real you know anything that veered towards like i had some things to say about liz hurley and i had to cut them you know <laughs> so she's certain certain things like i, I but, okay, this is okay to say this I wrote that along came Liz Hurley looking decidedly less glamorous than her normal, you know, screen, which was true. She wasn't in the makeup. She was she was in a sort of dressing gown almost. And, you know, really dowdy. It was great that she came to visit us because she was she was just hanging out on the boys boys floor. And that's what she was like. She was one of the boys. She was a great laugh. Yeah. So I wrote that. And my 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 editor went mad. It was like I was a, a sexist and nasty and. And I kind of wish that kind of stuff was kept in. So that's the kind of stuff. But yeah, I had to. I had to. I didn't get any pushback. Let's see. Um, people have said that, though. No one in the cast has said anything. But others, like I mentioned that Michael Cochran, you know, like us all on Sharp, like to smoke a jazz cigarette. You know, that's right. what we did on Sharp. Um, and someone said, oh, I can't believe you said that about Michael Cochran. And I, I spoke to Michael. I said, it's okay to say this. It was a hilarious event, you know, um, Sean him and um john tams were taking a train from crimea to moscow because they didn't want to fly yeah i remember and that and sure yeah he doesn't like flying anywhere does yeah he? he doesn't like yeah he 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 we used to fly in oh fine the first couple of years we'd we'd fly in on our, our charter flight uh he was fine but they were a bit hairy those flights and they're a bit nasty so he he's he deserves first class you know a star of a movie gets first class but we were on these horrible air ukraine charter flights with the bogs you wouldn't even let your dog go to the toilet you know amazing so hey. yeah i can i can i can well believe it so yeah um, so lots so anyway that's why he was on the train lots of things so no I, I didn't want to get anyone in trouble but um i did want to tell the full story you know of what yeah. happened but, but i did have to clean up slightly yeah <laughs> you you had a you got to work i mean in, in some ways you know it's a bit of an acting college because you got to work with other people who were coming up and you got to work with greats like um, Hugh Ross, who, 
is mainly known for stage, but some people watching may remember him from his fantastic turn in An Ungentlemanly Act mm. um, with um, the late, great Bob Peck, uh, directed by Stuart Urban. And my friends have just done a, an episode Stuart about Urban. Their channel. Yeah, Stuart Urban, who directed the first two episodes of what I consider to be one of the best television shows of all time, Our Friends in the North, which also had Mark Strong, who you also got yes. to work with, and uh, Daniel Craig in it. It launched both of their careers effectively. And I think Craig came back from Sharp and went straight into Our Friends in the North, I think. Yes, yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Um, and, and in fact, Mark Strong had just finished making Friends in the North when he came on to Sharp on the fourth year. Yeah, um, uh, just a fantastic show. Stuart Urban did the first two episodes and then sadly he was fired. Oh, um, right. But it's Stuart Urban, Mark, Mark Urban's brother, the BBC. That, that I don't know. You don't know. Okay, um, all right. But, yeah. uh, but, he but you're right. I absolutely was a total. I mean, you know, the first, the first, uh, my first year on Sharp, Brian Cox. I mean, I, I was a friend of my, Mark Paul McGann, but I really admire him as an actor and I thought he was great. So just working with him was fantastic. But Brian Cox was there. Yeah. Um, you know, Michael Cochran, he wasn't famous, but he was amazing and amazingly funny. Um, uh, Daniel Craig, we didn't know. Daniel Craig was no one, but you could see, I could see he was going to be a, amazing because he just exuded this insouciance and just, yeah, who are you? You know, arrogance. Oh, it's fantastic. Really, really, really cool guy. But I've watched, I've watched all these actors come in on my level and then just go off into the stratosphere. As you said, you know, uh, Daniel Craig on the first year, um, Emily Mortimer. Uh, yeah, Mark Strong, Paul Bettany, you know, all these guys that were, you know, on entry level on Sharp and then they're winning Oscars, etc. at the moment. So, yeah, so uh, it was fantastic. Uh, but as, as as I said about the uh, the Derek Jacoby watching him on stage, there were so many incredible actors in that. So, so I've been so lucky to have landed in projects where there's incredible people involved. Uh, but yeah, Sharp, Sharp was a great acting workshop for sure. Because you, you you worked with David Troughton as well, didn't you? Um, I'm sorry, yes, I forgot to mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Haygarth, who I think was also on um, Our Friends in the North, Julian Fellows, who of course now is mainly a director producer, right. Toby Stevens. Uh, yeah, Toby was on the latter sharps when uh, the Indian sharps. So I didn't do those. So there, there was the original Peninsula lot. Yeah, and then they did two more eight years after, set in India. Yeah, and those two are not in this box set, which no. I have. And I'm quite glad that they're not, because I've also got the Indiana Jones box set, which has the first three films in it. Mm. And I don't own the fourth film because it's not very good. No. That's all I'm going to say about that. Sure, um, sure. So. I mean, they, 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 they tried with the Indian ones, but they... I could have they, been a lot better. I could yeah, have been the, 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 the books they were basing the, the stories on were were prequels. So they were supposed to have happened before the Peninsula stories, before the original series. But of course, they couldn't age Sean that far backwards. So they set it in India in 1821, six years after Waterloo. So they had to mishmash around and change things. So that's why it sort of sort of missed the mark. And a, a, another interesting um, Bugsy Malone uh, connection for you. You also got to work with my good friend Warren Sire, didn't you? Mm. Absolutely. Warren Sire, we did um, Sharp's Mission, where he played an unctuous character called Shellington. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really good fun. We, we had a lovely time with uh, Warren. We hung out a lot. We we filmed in, uh, in Turkey, and his room was next to mine in, the, in Antalya Sheraton. So, yeah, we had a good time. And I did a podcast with him um, last year for Sharp's Mission. Ah, that's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah Which hasn't that... been edited yet. Oh, that's a shame. Well, we yeah. don't have to edit this one because it's going out live, so it's really Absolutely. easy. But um, he told me a story about that because me and him, we, we met when we were really young and then we lost touch. And mm. I didn't see him again for like 30, 40 years or something. Gosh, wow. You know, and it was like, oh, yeah, I remember we were talking up in the balcony and as child actors, this kind of thing. And um, he told me that on Sharp, that was when he decided to quit as an actor. He, he was standing on the balcony of his whatever apartment they were filming. And I think you were filming Turkey then by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said that was that was the night he, he sort of went out onto the balcony. He said, yeah, this is it for me. I'm going to move. And I think he's, he's a director of photography now. Yeah. Um, 
but he knocked it he knocked it on the head you also got to work with nicholas rowe yes nicky rowe yeah brilliant in fact nick rowe is going to be doing um uh, the london film fair at yeah. the National Hotel on the 19th of July, uh, June. So that's not long away. And I'm going down for some. Yes, Nicky wrote another one that was uh, one of the, the insiders on Sharp. He was, we hung out with him a lot. We had a lovely time with Nicky. Had a for, those, for those people watching, they might remember him in Young Sherlock Holmes playing the, the title role. And he was great, I thought. Amazing. You know? Yeah. And he's just uh, finished playing um, George Washington on a History Channel series last year, two years ago. I'm really good at that. Oh, I'm, still that's... gets some good roles. Yeah, he was. Um, yeah, he, he he still pops up in nice roles. Great guy, lovely guy. It's great to be reconnected with him because when I was when I did the book, we did a bunch of podcasts, and so I had to to con contact everyone. I hadn't talked to him in twenty five years. It was amazing. Good man. Good man. Well, when you when you speak to him next, let him he knows who I am because we've talked before and he was supposed to come to my film premiere, but he was in a he was in a show in the West End, so he couldn't make it. But he was kind enough to actually take the time to write to me and apologize for not, not being able to come. But I'd really like to get him on the channel. So please extend my uh, uh best. Okay, wishes. I will, I will. Absolutely, absolutely. Who would you say out of all the, the, the people you got to work with on Sharp, who was the the most fun. I don't mean the the, the regular guys. I don't mean uh, Derek and and um, of the guest actors that came in. Gavin O'Hurley. He played uh, Captain Leroy. Slaves, Cotton and Molasses. Massive character. Was in Willow. Was in um, yeah, yeah. yeah. American actor in England. Have passport. Will travel. Have you got an American part for me? I'm there. I know the actor you mean. And yeah. he was also in the Thunderball remake. Um, That's right. Yeah. Never, never say never, never again. Say never again. Yeah. Yeah. I unfortunately, died uh, in October last year. I, I was so shocked. I just, I just re reconnected with him. Um, I, I was I wanted to go out and visit him. He lived he lived in Bath or something. I was going to do it. So it was during the lockdown. I was planning to. You know, we were talking on the phone, and then suddenly someone on Facebook said, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry to hear about about Gavin." Like, what are we talking about? Talking? Quickly went on the web and found out. I was just, oh, it was such a shock. But he was such a great laugh. Again, he was an American. I lived in America. We could talk American together. We yeah. could talk American sports. We, you know, we had the same post relax relax and shoot uh, habits um uh, so yeah i really really got on really really well with him uh, as a one of the non regulars obviously i hung out a lot with sean i hung out a lot with perkins tongue um yeah. the younger chosen men but yeah on that first year i hung out so much with gavin hurley he was one of my main main buddies and we carried it on for a few years after sharp um i, I don't know if i really connected with anyone else as well as with him down the years because then on the second year i met my wife well i met, right. her, on the first, I met her on the first year she was an interpreter natasha uh, a local yeah. girl from crimea in yalta and um of course when you meet a beautiful woman and you start doing things there you have less time to hang out with the boys so so could, i will have to say she became my my main buddy down the rest of the years in the crimea you could call you could call your sequel book from yalta with love yeah, yeah. <laughs> or to, yeah. You know, Although you know, Crimea is Yalta, so yeah, yeah. yeah I mean yeah. that that is the double entendre of of the of the title, mm -hmm. because I I believe that the hardship and the crap and the the turmoil and the uh, the the ridiculous hardships we faced on Sharp really made the look of the show. It made us look like <clears throat> authentic soldiers who have been through conflict, uh, diseased, injured pissed off with our superiors it really gave it so crimea gave us that even though it or half killed us it gave the look that the show the the look of that authentic sheen i, I can't it, believe you're in a hotel with like a, no proper working toilets for about a week at one point weren't it? well that it? was because the water was cut off yeah so, was, so you can't flush it yeah yeah it was ridiculous we were I flushing mean, toilets with a with a with a with a bucket you're on this big show and you you you're like you're in a you're in a hotel with no proper working toilet, no proper working showers. At one point everyone went out and bought candles or something cuz Yes, yeah, there was power there. cuts, yeah. There was all sorts all sorts that went on on, on sharp. It, it, I you know, I should I should write a book about it. Oh yeah, I did. Oh, the the luxuries of uh, yeah. working for Thames Thames television drama. 
Yes. Jay, Benedict, Jay Benedict passed away around the same time as Gavin, if you remember That's Jay. That's right. Yeah, about a year before from COVID, apparently. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not sure I'm not sure about Gav, what, how, what what the deal was. I spoke to his wife, but I didn't want to say, what was it? What was it? You know, I didn't want to say Yeah, that, but... no. Because Tim Tim Bentick is a, a good friend yeah. of mine, and I'm hoping to get him um, on oh, the show. Oh, he'd be brilliant. Uh, yeah, I've also got his book. It's on the coffee table in the other room. He's written a great, great book. book and um, I remember him in... Uh, by the Sword Divided, uh, growing mm. up, um, great, great um, BBC drama series with lots of my liege and this kind yeah. of thing. Was that with the theme tune? You've got to fight for what you want. No, that's the Flashing Blade. Flashing Blade, which was, was Sean Bean's, which was Sean Bean's fave because of that the Blade. Was a, that was a um, French Spanish yes. co-production that was imported. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and it was on like Saturday mornings. Yeah. It was, and, and do you know what the funny thing was? When the box set of that came out in the UK, they'd never broadcast the last episode. So I don't know if you remember the last episode's a big fight and nearly all the characters die. No, I didn't and remember. No. And there's only one of them left alive. And they never broadcast they, they thought they thought that was the last episode, the, the BBC, but for some reason reason it hadn't been delivered. And when the box set came out, it was like and for the first time ever in the UK, including the last episode, and half the characters you thought were dead were all in this hospital, like bandaged up. How bizarre. It was really weird. Yeah, we're going a bit yeah, off topic love, there, but love, yeah, love. But also, um, what was the, the white horse? Was the white horse one? Do, 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 do. Oh, oh you're, you're probably too young actually for that. That's... No, I I vaguely remember that that theme. Yeah, another French series, the white horse riding. Lovely yeah, song. Yeah, but I'm I can't a... remember the I can't remember the 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 title of all the episodes you did of Sharp. Which one was your favourite? Which one do you think when you look back? Maybe well, I, I, get, I get asked this uh, loads and loads and loads. It's a simple answer: the the early episodes, um, Rifles, Eagle, Enemy, Honor. Yeah, and they were the episodes where all the chosen men were still there, and they had yeah. to start splintering Paul, us up and disintegrating Paul, Paul, us. Paul Trussell and um, and then Cooper. Um, I forget the name of the actor who played Cooper. Michael Mears. Michael Michael Mears. I felt um, I would agree with you. I, I rewatched them all in wow. preparation for this because um, we talked about it last year. So I rewatched them over the Christmas break, actually. Mm. And um, those, though, you're right. The first three are the ones that have aged the best. And and I think part of the reason is you've got that sense of camaraderie and you've gone from like kind of a unit to the fab four by the end of it and it's not yeah. as effective and i i really liked because tongue looked very different he kind of had that bandana and um everybody everybody was very different they were real different characters you with your, your little glasses and you know curly red bonnet and it, yeah it, it really lost something when it yeah. lost those actors and it was a shame that because Paul, I, I, I mean, it's in your book, so we don't want to say too much about it. But I, I think Enemy is my favourite. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I could easily see. I like Rifles because it has the sort of origin bit in it. But yeah, Enemy is fantastic. You know, Pete Postlethwaite, uh, yeah. Phil Whitchurch, the whole storming of the the cloister and free, and Liz Hurley and oh, the fantastic uh, Duco uh, from um, Theodore Aiken, the the main French baddie, brilliant. Yeah. He's You're right, great. yeah. I could I could plumb for enemy or rifles being my favorite. Um now Sharp's Company, which a lot of people say is the best episode. I'm not so enamored of that one because we were minimized. Uh the chosen men had us were minimized because the writer, Charles Wood, an absolutely fantastic writer who's written some brilliant stuff, didn't feel that lower ranked characters should have a lot to say, especially when talking to their superior officers. So that sort of minimize just the little grunts and small stupid lines i thought anyway but so yeah. so company was amazing but i don't have that as as um uh, uh, in my heart as a lovely episode company even though it's a brilliant episode i mean i know that you know look one uh, being a director and having worked with a lot of people an actor's gripe is often you know how many lines have i got but uh, and i know you brought that up in the book i've got to say though i 100 agree with you i think those characters they were the glue of the show, and um, by the end of it, uh, I think you made the point that to some degree they became glorified extras, and I, I feel that that was a real mistake. Yeah, um, it would have been great to actually 
have had an episode really that revolved all just around them with with Sharp himself. Yeah. And you know, maybe one guest villain or something. Maybe they got cut off. I don't know. I'm I, well, I well, a great a great example of this is when we're doing rifles, um, there was all the turmoil of the McGann and the switch to bean, and we we had to we had to shut down one um episode called Sharp's Gold, which yeah. is all in the book, and, and shoot it later on down the road. And um so it was we were all you know totally discombobulated, and they found out that they were like five minutes short we we ended up shooting in portugal after being in in, in crimea they they were short on us on on text so they went to john tams and they said can you write an origin story an origin scene uh, explaining where the chosen men had come from now isn't that amazing that scene wasn't in there already yeah yeah so yeah. so so that's one of the one most wonderful scenes ever in the whole that that scene i can read sir what can you do uh, uh where have you, what, you know all that the whole scene where he meets us beautiful scene so more of that could have happened more yeah. of that, that but what happened was um when when sean was asked to do the job he had been auditioned as i mentioned and had been rejected and then found out paul mcgann had got the job and found out how much paul mcgann was getting paid so naturally, you, you, you kind of say, no, I'll take the part, but I want twice. I want twice what Paul McGowan were getting. And they kind of had to do it because they were desperate. They needed to carry on filming and Sean was ideal. So they, 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 they went for that. And that squeezed the action budget from then on, on and on and on. Right. So, so we, and you know, some people say you don't deserve a, a, a who, who are you, Jason? You're, you are no one in sharp. You are barely anyone. People have said that. Why should you get a pay rise? We weren't given pay rises because they had to, they, 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 they said that Bino had taken all the money, which is rubbish because it's ITV trying to scrimp the budget each year. Yeah. Doing, doing it less so they can make more profit, but they yeah. couldn't crimp on Sean's money, which had been promised to be twice every time, you know? So, so they they welcomed dropping a chosen man who was on quite nice wages, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and so when Michael Mears mentioned, oh, you know, I kind of maybe I'll just do one episode this year. Is that okay? And I can do some theatre projects and then maybe come back next year. And say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Never came back. They were happy. Never replaced. Yeah. And yeah. then they decided to kill Perkins. That wasn't even in the book that they were doing. So you know they 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 were killing the golden goose in a way yeah trying to pay the golden goose <laughs> i but, can, you know, I can remember it. sitting in a room with a group of people a dear friend of mine called edward jackson was one of them who was on the phone to earlier today and um i think alexis webb might have been there and we were all about halfway through the the, the series overall and we all suddenly just started talking Where's that guy? And where's that other guy? What, yeah. what happened to them? Because there was no... I'll tell you what no. was really annoying about it. There was no explanation given, not even a kind of, oh, he's been transferred to another unit, sir. Or, oh, it's a shame we haven't got him. Uh, yeah, but he, you know, we lost him. Or Just, that's all it... it does, I don't know. It's just yeah. a bit shit, really. I mean, I mean, I understand. A rifleman tongue, Paul Trussell, he had been... Oh, he got this all in my book. He was offered a job at Mike Lee play before yeah. Sharp's second series had been greenlit and announced. Yeah. So he's an actor. Yeah, he got to go where the work got is. Got to go. I was in love with the concept of Sharp. I'd read the books. I was just totally sucked into the max. So I was going to do it come what may. I was going to not... Uh, if some massive job, if Spielberg came along or Aeon came along and I'm playing James Bond, then I'd say, okay, sorry, Sharp, bye-bye. But it would have to be massive to not do Sharp. So they didn't have much time to turn around and rewrite the script and add whatever they were going to do. So I understand that. That was fine. But with Michael Mears, they knew he was leaving. They knew he was not going to be back for the next one. And there was nothing. There was We had a little bit of a skirmish in, on the show, and he gets a little bit of a, a, a tick on his shoulder, and you see his costumes being ripped open. They're tending his wounds. But there's no explanation at all. And then he's gone. Mm. Not written. They had the time to do it, but but, you know, anyway. I shouldn't complain. It's all in my book, everyone, From Crimea With Love, available at all good book retailers. David says Sharp's Mission um, was Harris's best episode. Um, some classic moments. My my friend Aram, who was, I think she was on earlier, she may still be watching, still watch Sharp today, hasn't lost any of its appeal. I mean, so, you know, there you go. And yeah. she's a big, big, big fan of handsome, rugged actors. So, I mean, uh, I, mean I should, I, I, 
got carried away. I do love rifles, enemy, blah, blah. But as an actor, yeah, Sharp's mission and Sharp's sword were just were, were so fulfilling and wonderful. And I've been yearning for that for three years to have yeah. to have a, a bearing on, on an episode and do scenes with Sean. You know, we'd have to we have to rehearse for. We never had to rehearse for our scenes for, and we did this time because we're dialogue. So yeah, yes, thank you, whoever said that. Yes, uh, mission, mission is a good. It's a good episode. Another one that wasn't based on the book, by the way. So I, I, there's one more thing I want to mention about Sharp before we we move on, and then I'll, we'll talk about the Ukraine a bit before we wrap up. I've got to talk about that crap death scene of you and um, yeah. Tam in 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 Waterloo, because mm. when I watched that, it was, that was a bit like. I don't know if you remember the um, Blake Seven. Everybody got shot, right? That's the first time I remember as a kid getting on the phone outside of school hours, picking up the phone and calling the other kids in my class and going, "Oh my God, have you just seen Blake Seven? And then th this happened again with, uh, with with that episode. I'm like on the phone to Edward. Have you just watched uh, Charles Waterloo? Did you see that death scene? And by this time, I was already sort of had aspirations to be a director. Mm. It was just the way it was shot and the way it was handled. And I'm I'm sorry, I don't care if people hate me for saying it. It was crap. Yeah, it a lot of people have said that. Yeah. It's funny because I, I thought that we were it's funny you said about Blake Seven, because I thought we were the first to kill off main characters. I thought we were one of the first shows to do that, a main character. So it's yeah. funny that Blake Seven did it. Yeah. Um I was actually quite happy with it, the way it was filmed. Um because because I also thought that it was going to be the very end. I thought that was the end of Sharp, which which it wasn't. There were two more episodes. So I thought it's good to get out of the way. But um, I was just a bit miffed at the way it was dealt with afterwards. You know, there was no burial. There was no discovery of our bodies by Sharp. And it was like, it was quickly brushed out under the carpet. Oh, they're dead. Okay, phew, onwards. Whereas, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm... I I think the death, the actual action and the choreography of the two of you getting killed. I like the fact that you're, you know, trying to save each other. But mm. beyond that, I just felt because you were so invested in these characters and they had been in much more dangerous and suspenseful situations prior to this. So I felt it was a bit of a slap in the face that, oh, we're just going to go up the road and, and kill them up the road. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it just felt it, it didn't feel true to the law of the material that we had already all digested, that suddenly these characters would be killed in such an offhand manner. I didn't mind the fact that they, they died. I just felt they should have gone out in a big blaze of glory, defending the farmhouse. Maybe the doors burst open and it's a bit of a, you know, Alamo moment and there's 20 bayonets versus two and just something with a bit more oomph that, that you know, um, justified losing those. Because, they, again, they were too really important characters. And after, by the way, after your guys were taken out of it, I had no interest in watching the other episodes of the show. That's what did it for me. Yeah. I mean, that was the, that was the final episode, but yes. Um, to defend them. Yeah. You know. In the book, in the book, Hagman is killed. Sorry if it's a spoiler in Waterloo, Hagman gets a shot to the lungs or something. He's killed. Right. So they wanted to stay faithful to that. And they thought, well, let's kill Harris too. I don't know why. Why, can't, why just not kill Hagman? I mean, so that's why they did it. But, I, but you're right. It was just so offhandedly dealt with, like, whoosh. And, yeah, it was a bit wanky, the the whole, we run out of the farmhouse. Hagman gets shot in the head, you know, in, at close range. I go to shoot, but I'm out of ammo. Come on, no. And then my my rifle, which has, which has bayonet uh, uh, fixed, you know, it's a massive weapon. I decide to throw on the floor because I see Hagman's been Hagman's been shot in the head. I, I throw on the floor to run to him. I mean, it's ridiculous. I would have yeah. charged that bayonet. I would have killed the geezer that killed uh, um, uh, Hagman, turned around, defended myself, defended his body, started whacking him up. But no, I throw him yeah, that back, run towards him, and I get stabbed in the back. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what you described. It's kind of what I wanted to see or yeah. something, something to that. That, yeah, that it, degree, it but... needed a bit more, and then and then Harper says, "Oh, they knew what they were doing. They were soldiers, and that's it. Boom." Now, yeah, to be yeah. fair, although I hate saying "to be fair" because it's a real lazy kind of saying, um, it was Waterloo. There were yeah. eight thousand people killed that day. 
yeah, yeah. it was two yeah. days two days so so you know we're just another but couple of soldiers that died in this massive huge battle that changed europe you know so um i i want to talk about road to guantanamo quickly and then we'll oh, yeah. jump onto ukraine because that was a really important stage play that was then also made as a film which you were in correct um i don't know if it was a stage play Ah, okay. Because maybe I'm thinking of letters, letters from Guantanamo. Might have maybe, been but, but it's the same subject. It's dealing with yeah, the, yes. yeah, yeah. The, 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 I think there was a stage play called Letters from Guantanamo. That's right. Uh, which I think my friend Will Johnson might have been in, and then um, and because so, some of the storyline was about Westerners that were kept there. Who, who yes, were, it, the, yeah. remember the the Tipton Taliban? They were called the Tipton yeah. Taliban. There were three lads who who were went to a wedding in Pakistan uh, on on September the 9th or 8th or something he went to the wedding and thought hey let's let's go to Afghanistan have a look have a look around now i thought that sounded really suspicious to me Let, let's go and and this is after 911 now this is uh, this is after and they decide to go across the border they get picked up and they get chucked into Guantanamo right so, so i imagine that that thing you refer to letters from Guantanamo were probably used as a source work because it was directed by Michael Winterbottom. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't really have a script ever. We just were improving scenes and they would improv scenes. They went into they went into Afghanistan, they shot some stuff. They went into Pak no, they went to Pakistan to shoot a lot of stuff. And we were shooting in Tehran and Iran. Right. That's bizarre, how, isn't it? So how was, I, how, how was that? Oh yeah. well it was freaky. We was we we were shooting in a town called Zehedan, which is a which is a, a university town way down south near the Afghan near the Pakistan border. Mm. And um, uh, one of the hairiest moments, well, there were two hairy moments. The real hairiest moments was I went out to um, walk around town in Zehedan, you know, real two bit hot, dusty, rubbish town. And I'm sort of nodding hello to everyone. I'm obviously your Westerners, no other Westerners there. And suddenly these two sort of urchins roll up to me and uh and i say and they say hello i say hello and then one of them like pulls up a fucking knife in front of me not 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 too close to me not that close but enough to like yeah would have made someone shit their pants but i was like being cool and standing but the, his friend was like no 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 friend 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 and then quickly ushered him away i thought all right i better watch myself here uh but yeah. the next hairiest moment was um when we're driving to set from the hotel, we did the costume at home, and I'm playing an American CIA uh, intelligence officer in in American uniform, and I'm sitting on the back of a jeep riding open air through the streets of Zehedan, you know, <laughs> to, to the set. That was quite hairy, but it was so real and authentic. All the extras, the places we were shooting in, it was yeah. so real and freaky. But there was no script; we just improv it all. You know, great time, great fun, great interesting time my five, seven days in Tehran. And then we finished up, uh, I, I ended up in Tehran uh, to fly home and I went to go and visit the American embassy and everything. They were like, why do you want to do that? And, you know, it was, so it was a very interesting trip, I must say. Yeah, I've, not many actors can put that they've worked in Tehran on their, no, um, no. their, their, their CV. Well, look, I don't want to keep you much longer, but I just want to touch on this before we go. And you sure. said you were going to give me an hour and you give me an hour 20 already. I've just realised the time. So... Oh. Um, you've got family in the Ukraine. Um, of course, you met your, um, you know, love of your life in 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 the Crimea, um, and um, uh, you know, that, when I was reading um, your, your your book, I'm trying to remember now. I don't think the war had started then, but there was trouble. There was tension because there was quite a bit of build up before the invasion. There was a lot of rumblings and this kind of thing. And I remember. Um, reading through the book and I would go on Google earth and have a look at these places you were talking about and seeing how much they changed. And if I could do a street view, I'd go and have a little look. And mm. I like doing that sort of thing. You know, you were in this, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about the book for people watching and de definitely do buy a copy is you, you talk about what the place was like when you first went there. And like you said, you had three tours of duty. And then mm. when you're back on the third tour of duty, you're saying, out. Oh, it's really funny how all these little cottage industries had opened up with trading of money and importing of goods and, and things. And like people knew Sharp was coming back. So we've got to make sure we got things for the Westerners and the quality of the local food had changed and mm -hmm. what was on offer had changed. I found all that 
really really fascinating quite quite endearing but your 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 wife natasha must have family in areas that are affected by the conflict is that correct yes um we spent the first few days 25th 4th february shitting ourselves because i thought they were going to i thought putin would sweep through ukraine in two days and then everyone be subjugated yeah uh, I, I was more scared of bombs dropping than I was of what they did in Bucha, in Bucha, because I thought that, you know, I said to him, it's okay, uh, Russian troops aren't ISIS. They're not going to go around beheading and killing people. It's going to be fine. But then, uh, then I saw that column getting closer and closer to Kiev, And I really was, I had a thing in my stomach because every night my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law were going out to the shelters and Natasha was all night on the phone to them. And it was just, I, I, oh, I was so finally, we got them over here, and I, and I I can I started to feel better. I I, I felt easy, you know. That they're living with us; it's totally cool. But then um, uh, my si sister in law decided to go home because she's she's missing her husband and her dog. So she's now back in Kiev. And last night they started bombing Kiev again. So I mean, her mum's going to stay with us here because she, Natasha's not going to let her go back. But it's 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 really nerve wracking. And now, especially now she's gone back. I thought it's going to be fine. Kiev is going to be left alone, but so yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's 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 it's. I'm I'm watching the news like mad and wishing every Russian tank blown up and cheering for it and just yeah. feeling gutted every time I see a smashed up town or Mariupol or all these other towns being completely destroyed. It's hard to watch. It's hard to and you know Crimea. I was so so attached to Crimea and oh, I don't want anything to happen to it. And then, and he obviously he took it bloodlessly, which, you know, was sort of okay. But now I'm thinking, you know, are we going to bomb Crimea? Are we, are they going to start attacking Crimea? Was it, you know, it's just, and, and I was thinking, yeah, do it, hit Crimea, smash Sevastopol, smash him out of there. But then that's going to just escalate the war even worse. But, but I don't yeah. see what they're going to do, what they're going to do. They're going to just, just knock them back and not take that Crimea yeah it's, it's going to be hard enough to take back the donbass and all these other areas it's going to be it's it's hard, it's frightening i can't see it ending very soon it's it's awful it's awful and did, you, so, yeah. did you did you ever get to visit the theater in Mar Mar mariupol is it no. the, the classic yeah because that's, no. that's i mean that's a really old theater that's been there i think since the days of world war Two. yeah and you know i'm pretty sure quite deliberately they put a bomb right through the middle of the bloody thing and people were sheltering in it as well killed a lot it, of people it even said outside children deity written in massive letters deity yeah. children now they're saying oh it's because they were hiding soldiers in they were hiding musicians munitions rubbish rubbish that ukrainians aren't going to do that hide so or their soldiers behind human shields it's ridiculous it's it's bordering on genocide they're trying to smash up ukraine it's ridiculous it's and and we have to pussyfoot around putin now you know macron saying oh you mustn't humiliate putin no he must be humiliated he must be completely smashed up so either people in russia take him down or or we just make him so insignificant but that could be a widening of the war yeah it's it's a real difficult one and but i will i will say when when i came back in 92 to my mates mm. uh in england and we watched, I watched, we, uh, the, the Ukrainian army were our, uh, they set up our base camps. They were our, the, you know, they were our extras. We were very close to the Ukrainian army. And I could see how dilapidated and how crap it was. I visited Balaclava. I saw the subs rusting. I thought, we should have fucking invaded Russia years ago. We should have smashed them to ground. They would have fallen in seconds. And actually, that's exactly what's happened. They are rubbish. I don't know if you listen to this, Putin, but. The Russian army are very bad and they're corrupt and their equipment is terrible. And I yeah. said that back in 92. I bet you we should have invaded years ago because we would have kicked their asses. Well, I mean, I mean, it's you know, this is the problem, isn't it? War, wars are not the fault of no. populations, it's it's a bunch of old men, old geezers, getting a lot of very young men to to you know kill and be killed on, on their behalf. And of course, the civilian population are all always caught in the in the middle uh, i mean i think you are right in the sense that the only way that it's going to finish is if he loses um so much credibility at home mm -hmm. uh that internally other powers 
you know, decide look, we've lost so much credibility on the world stage now. And the problem is he won't back down because of that. If he no. does back down, his political career is uh, finished. Um, David Macy, I think, is agreeing with your sentiments as truth to power. Um, and Jay's the thing is, the thing is that the, the person that takes him out is not going to be a liberal, left leaning, left leaning, lovely. Let's come out of Crimea. Let's get. It's going to be someone twice as ruthless. Yeah, that's the trouble. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, the, Russia must not be allowed to come back. They, I'm sorry. I, I first I thought this is Putin's fault, but the people have been brainwashed. My 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 and the, my mother-in-law's downstairs. She talks to her cousin in Sevastopol in Crimea and she's saying, oh, darling, it's OK. They're coming to liberate you. It's OK. The Nazis, the, it's going to be fine. I mean, that's what they're saying because they're brainwashed. They are completely brainwashed. There mm -hmm. are no Nazis in Ukraine. As I say in my book, in the Crimea, they celebrated Ukrainian Independence Day at the end of October, whatever it was, end of August. Not independence from Kiev, not independence from Moscow and USSR. They celebrated that. Mm. There was no persecution of Russian speakers. They all spoke Russian. I didn't even hear Ukrainian spoken once in the Crimea. Mm. It was all bullshit what he was saying, how all these how Russian language is being suppressed. Ukrainians are suppressing Russians. It's absolute rubbish, which we all know. I don't know why I'm even saying this. No, no listen, man, It's. I think these are really interesting topics and it, it's good, you know, it's good to have a perspective from somebody who's actually got something at stake because I hear, you know, hear people talking about it in pubs, pubs back and mm. forth and this kind of thing. You've got family over there. For you, it's it's yeah. it's it's real, you know, this thing. Yeah, it's, it's real. Uh, I mean, yeah. You know, and uh, I've, again continued best wishes to them i know i offered your mother-in-law my sofa for a couple of weeks if it had helped fortunately yeah, jason jason didn't need to take me up on that 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 offer uh, i'm sure she would have found my dvd uh, collection interesting do you think if he was portrayed in an unflattering light you could ever portray putin in a stage play um i could yes in fact yeah. someone has a, someone asked me to a couple of years ago actually can you play putin and yeah. I said, oh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> but yes, I, mean, I, I, like, I know you're too tall in in, in some ways, mm. but you know the, the wonders of uh, magic. Yeah. But I'm good at playing baddies as well. So, so okay. I think we've got one quick question here before you go. Has Jason read uh, Voltaire's Candide? Very strange but funny book. Have you? Yes, I have. I read it before Sharp Sword. I wanted to have some sort of um, knowledge, and I've read I've read other books. He's read um, he wrote something called Letters from england and it's brilliant i suggest david if you if you if you if you're into voltaire read letters from england but yeah i did read it. it's really bizarre i couldn't tell you what it's about really <laughs> um, um i should read it again i did actually buy a copy to read again uh, but i haven't done it yet but yeah. Uh, yeah i do make sure i read all these things i i'm a bit of a method actor as i grew up in america as i went to college in america i do i'm, I'm a bit of a method head that's why I read all the sharp books and read the Rifle and Harris book and all that stuff. I, I like to be have some background knowledge through my uh, eyes. Well, I think that's good. I think that's, that's a good thing. Well, look, Jason, it's been brilliant having you on. You've stayed on for loads of um, extra time. Have you got, I think you told me um, you've, you've got uh, another book you're working on. Is that right? Because you said you were writing. Yeah, it's, yeah, yes, it is. It's I've written lots of notes. It's sort of autobiographical to do with my dad and me. Grew up in the 60s, 70s and moving to America because I moved there when I was 14. I'm going to try and encapsulate all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, my wife decided she wanted a doggy. So we bought a dog and my, the, the, my writing time has been completely erased. I used to get up at like 4.30 in the morning, go downstairs, put the kettle on, sit at the table. Everyone else gets up at 6 or 7.30 and I could get work done. Now it's I get up, I get a face wash from a puppy and I have to go walking it and it's lovely. So I'm <laughs> going to try and re-carve out a different time of day to do that. But, you know, with a puppy, it's it's murders. But, yeah, it's all in notes and I've got files on my computer. It's getting there. Well, listen, when you when that, when that book's ready to drop, why don't you come back? We'd love to have you back on. Come back and cool. we can do a big plug about it and you can you can talk about uh, all of that. And we, uh, we might do a project before that. You never know. Well, yeah, you never you never know. You that, never that, know. That, that, that is indeed that is indeed true. And if that's the case, we'll 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 come back on to talk about that. Well, look, the, uh, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for your comments and questions as well. Um, do please uh, keep up the love for the channel because it's growing 
steadily. We're creeping up to 1,000 subscribers now. That will be a big uh, a big benchmark when we hit it. Um, I've got uh, some more people coming on in the near future. I don't have an interview lined up for next Wednesday, but I'm trying to secure somebody for that now. Um, two independent horror filmmakers are going to get them back on soon. And I've also got um, Craig Fairbrass coming on in a couple of weeks to talk about his top 10 favourite crime uh, shows. And I'll be talking about mine as well. And then before that, we've got top top 10 favourite disaster movies. Lots to pick from there. So um, that's one of my favourite genres. So I'll be talking about that with another guest. Jason, thanks ever so much uh, for coming on. Um, you've been a wonderful guest. I'm just going to show that book again. It's available now um, on Amazon. Uh, Jason's also at some events uh, where you can buy a signed copy from him. You're going to be at one of the film fairs, right? Come yeah, I, well, it's, I will be there, but I'm not in a, a selling capacity. But my next, um, I'm doing a festival uh, next weekend, actually, the Folks in Astrid uh, Festival. I will be doing several festivals over some. If you check Facebook or my Facebook sites, Sharps Rifles and Rifleman Harris fan site, you can get info there. It's easy to get in touch with me. Go on the web. You can find my address, la, 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 la. Yeah, all of that information, if you look, guys, it's all down there already um, in the blurb under this. Thanks very much for tuning in to the Outcast Creative. Do like and subscribe, and we shall see you all again real soon.